from Mothers Out Front in Fairfax County with Bobby Marcella, who is taking the <laughs> um, I've been active in local environmental advocacy for a few years now. And when I learned that Mothers Out Front was building a, a presence in Northern Virginia, I jumped at the chance to participate. A Mothers Out Front is a group for mothers and others, so thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, mobilizing for a livable climate for future generations. I have a four-year-old daughter who will start kindergarten in Fairfax County in the fall of 2020. Um, she's sassy, she's hilarious. She never stops moving and being her mom is the best thing that we do. Um, but according to the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, if we don't begin to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the next few years, we will see the effects of the climate crisis become progressively worse. For Northern Virginia and my little girl, that means more unbearably humid 90 degrees days, like the one we had today, um, more deadly rain and wind storms. I drove in pretty terrible torrential downpour on my way here. Um, and who knows what else? Um, by the time my little girl is in high school, and that's only gonna be about 10 years from now, uh, these storms could be catastrophic. And as her mom, I'm really worried about what could happen and what kind of future she might have. So I spend my free time, and if you're a mom, you know there's not a lot of that, <laughs> with Mothers Out Front and as co-chair of another local climate group, 350 Fairfax, looking and advocating for realistic solutions to the climate crisis. And one of the solutions that could be a real winner is electric school buses, and that's the subject of the Clean Buses for Kids campaign. Um, electric buses are cleaner, healthier, and safer for our kids, and let me tell you why. Uh, diesel exhaust is clearly harming our kids' health. Just look at the rise in asthma rates over the last few years. Electric buses, on the other hand, have zero exhaust emissions. That means cleaner air, less asthma, less uh, carcinogenic exposure for our kids, and everyone else for that matter. Electric school buses have lower greenhouse gas emissions overall, even when the source of electricity is taken into account. Cutting greenhouse gas emissions means fewer scary weather events and a livable climate for my daughter and everyone else. Uh, electric school buses are also cost saving in the long run. They have fewer parts, which means maintenance costs will be significantly longer, and electricity is a cheaper fuel source than diesel, so gas will be cheaper too, or fuel costs will be cheaper too. And the upfront cost of diesel buses is rising as air quality standards rise, whereas the cost of electric school buses is dropping and is gonna continue to drop, especially when they start being mass produced in the next few years. And all this means money left over to spend on our teachers and our kids' education. So we are asking Fairfax County Public Schools to begin the transition to fully electric school bus fleet. And if you support us, please spread the word using our hashtag on social media, hashtag clean buses for the number four kids. Clean buses for kids, it's all over our stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, so electric school buses could be a big win for Fairfax County and everyone knows it. We have a lot of support for clean buses for kids already from groups like 350 Fairfax, Clean Fairfax, Environment Virginia, Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions, Food and Water Watch, Generation 180, and Moms Clean Air Force. Thank you for your early and enthusiastic support. <laughs> heartened by the number of elected officials and candidates I see in the room. Thank you so much for all of you for coming and showing interest in clean buses for kids and in our kids' health and safety. Our program tonight is short and packed with great speakers. First up is Pat Hines, school board member representing the Hunter Mill District. She graduated herself from Fairfax County Public Schools and so did her two kids. She lives in Reston and teaches in Arlington and has been on the board since 2012. Over the last seven years, um, she's been an advocate for strong environmental leadership from the board, and we so appreciate that. Welcome back.
so much, and they get um, educated and they educate us. We're so fortunate in this area to represent this constituency that is incredibly well skilled and well informed. And what you have to bring to this is unlike probably any other country. So thank you so very much. Um, I'll give you a, a quick background on sort of where the school system is right now on EV buses. Um, and we are just at the beginning. You know? I keep saying going from zero to net zero in 20 years or less is going to be a challenge, right? And we are, that's where we're starting. Um, but the good news is uh, the Fairfax County School Board and the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors have joined together to form something we're calling the Joint Environmental Task Force, or the JET for short. And that task force will include um, people from the community um, who, who are knowledgeable and advocate in, in, on these issues. And the, the JET Task Force will actually have its first inaugural meeting in early September. So we're very excited about that. The mission of the JET is going to be to lead. As your local public uh, officials, we want to lead on climate action. So we're going to take our facilities and our transportation and convert to renewable fuels. That's the goal. Um, we're also going to work on workforce development and some other uh, issues that we think we can do together. Um, but the, the main goal is to lead, you know, to recognize that we have a great opportunity. The school system's physical footprint is four times the size of the Pentagon, and we have the largest bus fleet in the country. So we have a great opportunity here. Um, and just on the facility side, uh, the county and the school system have joined together in a request for proposals for solar PPAs, which you may be aware of. So that's exciting, and it's, it's moving. But on buses, I have to say, we're still sort of behind the starting line, and we have a lot of work to do in a short amount of time. And um, so as I said, the school system has a tremendous number of buses. I think it's 1,600 buses. In. And um, the EV buses, as you may know, cost three times what a diesel bus costs, right? So that's our challenge. We cannot, as a public entity, go out and just start spending three times as much for buses, even though the uh, the maintenance later is less, and even though we will be spending less for fuel, that upfront cost is a significant um, barrier for the school system. So we need partners, right? And we have partners in the county. We have partners in state government. I see Mark Keene, your delegate here. Um, thank you, Mark. Mark has been a, a great supporter of everything we've wanted to do in Richmond, and hopefully on November 5th, he will get some more friends in Richmond to do more of the things we want to do in Richmond, because um, we do need that support. Um, uh, and, and of course, we have the wonderful advocates. But it seems to me, in learning about how this is done in other places, how local communities are able to actually make this happen and move as quickly as they want to move toward EV buses, you need another kind of partner. And what I've noticed, the model is that the local utility will partner with the local government, right? And what has happened is that the local utility will actually help to defray those upfront costs, basically buy at least parts of the buses, right? It's a win-win-win, right? Because the, the school system gets to make that investment up front, gets all the benefits of that investment, pays less for energy, as Julie was talking about, because the electricity will increasingly cost less than diesel fuel. It's a win for the local utility, because they now have a whole bunch of customers that they didn't have before. Instead of filling our buses with diesel fuel, we're plugging them in, mm -hmm. right? That's 1,600 customers that the utility didn't have before. And what you also have, especially in Fairfax County, with so many buses, we literally have hundreds of buses parked overnight, mm -hmm. and sometimes for days on end in the summer, relatively idle. That's a battery farm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that is something that utilities are increasingly interested in using as well. So it's a win, 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 win. Right? Um, but we, we really need it to happen yesterday, right? Um, and so we're, we're kind of at the starting line. I think that's the best way to go. We'll be learning more about the different ways to, um, to, to make EV buses happen in a place like Fairfax County. But that to me seems like the most promising approach. Um, and so uh, I, I think um, what, what I, the other thing I wanted to say about that is um, in partnering with, hopefully, the local utility, I think it's going to be important that we make clear we need more than just a pilot, right? I think pilots are really important and they're really helpful. We can make those happen quickly, which is wonderful. But we also need a long-term partner. 
we need aggressive goals, and we need aggressive strategic planning to get there. Right? So we need a partner, we need all our partners to be with us on that from now until we're done. Right? Um, so uh, I, I hope that's where we're headed. And um, I, I want to thank you all again so much, everyone who's turned out, everyone who's organizing. The Joint Environmental Task Force, the county and uh, school board task force, will meet for the first time on September 3rd uh, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon at the Mason District Government Center. And I hope that people, there's going to be a, a news release that will come out soon. I hope people will follow that group. This is not going to be one of those committees that just sits around and, you know, doesn't get anything done. If we have Dahlia Palachek is here, she's my colleague on the school board. She's going to be another member on the, the JET with me. Um, that is where policy will begin for both boards, for your school board and your county board. Policy proposals will come out of the JET and go back to the boards. So if this kind of thing is going to happen, it is going to come out of the JET. That's the idea. So I hope everyone who came out here today to launch this campaign will stay engaged uh, and will follow the JET and stay in touch with Dahlia and with me. Um, and we can, we can get this done. All right, thank you so much. is a candidate for school board in the Providence District. And why we invited him was because he has a vision for an FCPS Green New Deal, and it includes electric buses. Um, so and he's also kind of an expert on this topic. He wrote like a, a long paper about it. Is that right? <laughs> so welcome. This is Carl Fresh. Feeling there's a lot more experts in this room than I am. but. Uh, Thank you all for being here. It is exciting to see this turnout uh, on a rainy, uh, storm-ridden day for a very important topic. I have a plug-in hybrid car. When I first got it, people would ask me, does it move as fast as a regular car? Oh. When you press the gas, does it move? I said, well, you don't press the gas. <laughs> um, people are now asking me, are electric buses ready? They may not know that 20%, almost 20% of the electric buses around the world, uh, of the buses around the world are electric buses. So yes, we are ready. It's just a matter of whether we're willing. And here in Fairfax County, we have a unique opportunity to lead the way. 1,600 buses is exactly right. What does that mean? 1,600 buses equals 10 million gallons of diesel fuel a year. 1,600 buses means 200,000 tons of diesel air pollutants in our atmosphere every year that we're breathing in our beautiful community, that our kids are inhaling while they're on the bus. The 110,000 kids who sit on the bus going to and from school into different activities. The 25% of them that are on the bus for at least 30 minutes, uh, or for 30 minutes or more. So we have a, a lot to do to get this done, uh, and we have to get started. Uh, Pat's exactly right. You know, we can't delay. We can't just settle for a pilot. We need to be aggressive about our opportunities here because it's about a lot of different things. Electric buses use less fuel. They're quieter. Um, they're, frankly, better for the students all around. When they're sitting on the bus, they're not constantly here. I mean, we've all been on a school bus before, right? Um, there's also some interesting opportunities beyond uh, the environmental and public health effects. We have the second largest bus fleet, public bus fleet, in the country here in Fairfax County. If we decide to green our bus fleet with electric buses, doing so with 1,600 buses presents an interesting opportunity for the region, especially while the county is looking to diversify our economy. If we put out an RFP for a project to green our buses, to make them electric, companies from around the country will be coming here and I have no doubt that industry will spring up around an opportunity like that. Uh, this is the beginning uh, of, a, of a huge opportunity that can get started here in Fairfax. When we move on this issue, and we will move on this issue, in the first quarter of the, the new school board, we need to make sure that there's an RFI out there and that we move very quickly to an RFP to get this, pro this process started. When we move on this, other school districts around the state will follow suit. We can put an anchor in the ground in the mid-Atlantic and show that we're the leaders on this issue, and we can begin attracting other businesses and other opportunities that will invest in our community and further insulate ourselves from the 
interesting things happening in Washington. Because at the end of the day, Washington is not solving the climate crisis for us. That's why we're all here, right? Every level of government has to do its part, and that includes our school board. So your responsibility beyond supporting electric buses is to talk to your public officials, talk to your candidates for office, for every office. Ask them where they stand on these fundamental issues. If they don't seem to have thought about it, that might be a clue for what you think. You need to expect real results and real plans from people because if we don't start solving this crisis now, it's gonna be even harder than it was when we first began. So thank you all for being here. Thank you Mothers Up Front for, for pulling this together. Um, it is heartening to see that the community is leading the way on these important climate issues whether it's the students that got the conversation started around solar technology in our schools, or whether it's mothers and students who are now pushing the conversation around electric buses, we owe a debt of gratitude to you that we can't repay. The only way we can even make a down payment on it is by joining you in this fight. Thank you. who's represented the 35th District and Virginia's House of Delegates since 2009. Over the last 10 years, Delegate Keem has been an uh, outspoken environmental advocate in uh, Richmond, sponsoring and co-sponsoring many bills that promote renewable energy and green sector jobs. He has two kids who attend Fairfax County Schools. Welcome, Delegate Keem. Does any of the press have any uh Mic back here. If not, I'm going to speak like this. Is that okay? Can you hear everybody? So uh, first of all, thank you, Julie, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. And thank you to uh, Bobby, to Bob, to all the other members of Moms Out Front. Incidentally, I was in Richmond all day today. And actually, last night until this morning, I had a, a meeting with the governor and his uh, staff on the fiscal state of our commonwealth. He does it twice a year. And so we had a presentation there. And in the same building I was in, the General Assembly, was a meeting of the State Crime Commission, where we are currently debating and c considering what to do about the rash of gun violence that we're seeing, especially in Virginia and, and other places, but across the country we're seeing this unbelievable and, and unacceptable amount of violence from guns. And so as I was walking through the, the committee rooms to say hi to my friends and to support those that were there to testify, I noticed a lot of members of Moms Demand Action. Uh -huh. So there seems to be a theme here. Yes. When moms get involved, <laughs> things happen. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll tell you, as, as somebody who um, has an amazing, incredible mother who brought me to this country and raised me and, and made me the person that I am today, literally nothing would happen in this country and this world without moms who care not just for themselves and their families, but for other families and their children. And that's, I think, the spirit of this whole conversation today. It's not about Julie taking care of her daughter, or me taking care of my kids, or all of us taking care of our own individual kids. It's about the fact that Mother Earth is suffering, and that all of us, stepping into the place of Mother Earth, want to be that mother for all humankind. And that's why I think this conversation should start and end with the bigger picture of climate, and where we are with this crisis, and how this small, but very, very reasonable, and, and very doable project of electrifying our school buses, 1,600 in Fairfax to start with, but across the state and across our nation. It's a small step, but in the overall picture of how we combat this uh, unbelievable and, and just traumatic uh, climate crisis that we're facing, that this is in fact a step towards the right direction. So I thank you all for being here. Thank you, uh, your leadership in particular, but thanks all the organizations. I know 350 is here, I know uh, Climate Reality Project is here, and so many other organizations, Sierra and others who fought this fight every single day. Thank you for being part of this conversation. But we need to broaden this conversation outside of the environmental corridor, the clean energy corridor, into something that affects all of our lives. Because as you've heard, and I'm sure you'll hear more about this, when kids, including my kids, both of them have uh, severe allergies, my son has uh, very, very severe allergies, when they're sitting on a bus that's fuming uh, diesel fuel and all the fumes that come, and they have no choice but to sit there when they went to schools right here in this area, they had no choice. They have come home and they'd be coughing and suffering, and we, you know, we always have to make sure that they're taking their pills every day, and my son still gets injections twice, twice a week. We could eliminate a lot of that if we don't put more toxins into the air. And so this isn't just about saving a few bucks for the county, saving in terms of environmental concerns. It's about making sure that our, our young generation grow up healthier than they can, as they can uh, be today. So that's that. Now, let me just go back to wh where I started. 
I was in Richmond today, and the governor presented his uh, budget situation, what's going on with our revenue, and the good news is we're in a very strong economy. And uh, Virginia has now been ranked number one again as the most friendly place for business, so those are all good things. Afterwards, the Secretary of uh, Finance did a presentation and dug deeper into what's going on in terms of the revenues, where they're coming from, what our ex outgo is, expenses, and these are all news stories that all of you have heard before. We certainly uh, depend our resources for the state on things like jobs and businesses here. We have a strong government here, and federal government and taxes, tax base that's pretty strong here. And we have a pretty strong tech corridor and cybersecurity and healthcare, so it's good. It's good that we're attracting these companies. It's also good that Amazon decided to come here. So, you know, for notwithstanding all the, the concerns about the housing concerns and, and transportation, the reality is we are doing well. But when you just look a little bit ahead of the forecast, what you see are some danger spots. Because like most states, Virginia is dependent on a certain number of sources for revenue, and our expenses are growing every year. Our folks, blessedly, are living longer, but their health costs end up at the end of life more than they do when they're younger. We have more children being born in Virginia, and therefore our public schools are bursting at the seams, as uh, Pat and uh, Dahlia will tell you, and I know Carl will be addressing that issue as well. So our schools are overcrowded. And of course, we have a lot of other expenses, including infrastructure. We have roads and bridges that need more repairs. And so as we're looking at the revenue sources, one of the largest sources of revenue we always have are taxes. And one of the big areas that we've always collected taxes are from fuel taxes. Every time you go to the gas station down the street here, every time you pump a gallon of gas, you're spending a little bit of that money and giving that to Uncle Sam, and a little bit of that money to your state uh, folks in Richmond, and some of that money goes to other expenses as well. Well, what we're seeing is that dollar amount of gas taxes go down every single year. And the reason is because we made some stupid decisions a few years ago to cap the dollar amount that we would do because we had a, a governor who decided that getting rid of the gas tax was a good political idea. Well, so we're now suffering from that. So we have less gas taxes coming into the state on the revenue side. But the, downside, the positive side is vehicle sales are going up. And I was really excited to say, wow, more people are buying more cars. Therefore, we're making up a little bit of the lost money on the gas side by having more cars being sold. And I thought enthusiastically, that must be all those electric vehicles, right? All those hybrids, those great clean energy cars. So I asked a question to the secretary. I said, Mr. Secretary, I saw that your graph has one number going up, one number going down. I understand the gas issue. I understand that. But what about on the sales side? How much percentage of those cars that are being sold that raises uh, sales taxes for the state is coming from electric vehicles? And he says, very, 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 very little. In fact, half of 1%. I said, then how do you explain the fact that the sales prices, the taxes that we generate from the sales of auto vehicles are going up? And he says, Ford 150s. That is the fastest selling, the best selling vehicle in America today, and same thing in Virginia. So here's the irony of it, folks. At a time when we're talking about climate change, at a time when we're thinking about how we change our state and put our state in the right way, so that the revenues that we generate come from clean sources and that we're spending our money towards the right things. We have a population, our fellow residents, who are so dependent on fossil fuel that not only are they buying uh, old cars that are still using fossil, but they're actually doubling down on SUVs and pickup trucks. And our friends who are on the manufacturing side, Ford, GM, and all of our other companies, you see how many big cars that they're making now? Now, there might not be as gas guzzling as there once were, because the federal government decided to cap the cafe at a certain late rate, but the reality is they're still only making 20 miles per gallon, 25 at most, as opposed to electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. So folks, we have at least three things we can do in state. And I know you've heard from our local folks, and I'm, I'm really excited to work with uh, Dahlia and Carl and everybody else who's gonna be working with us at the local level. But at the state level, there are at least the three things that we can do, and, and I need your help on this. Number one, we need to find out a, a way to incentivize or maybe reverse incentivize the fact that people are still using gas fuel cars. And they're still buying gas fuel cars and not buying electric cars or hybrid cars. We went the opposite direction with our uh, exemptions, hybrid uh, exemptions here on I-66 and 495. We've actually grandfathered that out, so that's not gonna happen anymore. Mm -hmm. But we need to find a better way to provide either a tax credit instead of something that says that if you buy an electric vehicle, that gets rid of the words MP, uh, MPG and replaces with MPC, right? Miles per um, charge. Miles per charge, as opposed <laughs> to miles per gallon. 
if we start I, uh, mentally thinking about miles per charge instead of miles per gallon, we will incentivize you. And if you consistently double down on miles per gallon, we're going to find a way to disincentivize you. So that's one piece of this puzzle that we have to crack at the state level. Second piece is for consumers, we're not talking about the, the school bus and the larger fleets, but for consumers, you need that sense of this is a right purchase for you. If you're going to spend 15, 20, 30, 40,000 dollars on a, on a vehicle, you want to make sure that you can get your money's worth out of that. That means getting rid of the range anxiety so that when you're driving down to Richmond or to further south, if you've got kids down in uh, Blacksburg, you want to drive down to visit them. We want to make sure that we have stations along the way that they can take a break and make sure that they don't end up uh, stranded somewhere. So we have to build an infrastructure in the state that follows the models of some really innovative things happening on the west side in the mountain states to make sure that we work with the partners in the industrial and the private sector to develop a, a grid of the, uh, stations and it's charging stations so that these car owners can feel like this is the trend of the future and that Virginia is also uh, making an investment. And the third, but most importantly, we can't talk about this just as EVs. We can't talk about this just as vehicles. We have to talk about this in the grand scheme of how do we reduce the carbon footprint. And in that concept, as good as our friends of, uh, from Dominion might be in terms of working with us on this project, and I welcome all utilities to come to the table in good faith to come up with some innovative solutions at the local level, at the state level, it's a different conversation. Dominion does not negotiate with us at the state level. And as a senior member of the, the Democratic Caucus who serves on the committee that deals with our energy and environment regulations, I will tell you that the only time that they will listen to us when we have a good proposal like the Solar uh, Freedom Bill that we've drafted is when they feel that there's something in it for them. But if there's nothing in it for them, there's no political will on, on, in the Richmond to overcome that challenge to pass something into law. So the way to do that is to send me some friends. So the way to do that is to put me in a position where my bills can actually pass because we have the majority of people that actually vote for that and not the minority of people that scream and yell and we don't get anything done. So from a big picture perspective, we have a very aggressive, very bold, very robust agenda on addressing climate change for regulating our utilities to making sure that we do everything we can to provide solar for consumers as well as for, for businesses and, and uh, governments across the board, but we need your help. So today is just the first day of this campaign, but keep in mind, this campaign is not a narrow silo campaign of just EVs. This is a larger conversation about where we need to go as a state, as a nation, as a world, and if mothers step up once again, I believe that Mother Earth will be saved. speaker is Bobby Monticella, who is the mother of two Fairfax County students and a tireless environmental advocate and my co-leader at uh, Mothers Out Front Fairfax County. Thanks, Julie. Um, well, first of all, I just want to really thank our great speaker. Oh, I can't <laughs> <laughs> um, Our great speakers, Pat Hines, Carl Frisch, and Delegate Keen. Thank you all so much for taking the time to be here and your support in our Clean Buses for Kids campaign. Um, and thank you to everybody who came out to help us kick off this project. We really appreciate it. Um, so before we wrap this up, I just want to say a couple things about why we wanted to start a Mothers Out Front group in Fairfax and, um, and why our group thought this campaign was important. So like Julie, I jumped at the idea of starting this because I just love the idea of work, moms working together to create a better future for our kids. And the group liked the electric bus campaign because we felt like it was a great way to do something concrete and make a difference in our local area. So since starting this campaign, our group has learned so much. And I'd love to share with you a couple things that really made a big impact on us and made us feel like this campaign is crucial for our kids. So the first one, and I think, I'm not sure if somebody said this already, but I was shocked by this. School buses are the largest mass transit system in our country. So nationwide, there's like 480,000 school buses versus 140 public transit buses, 140,000. Um, so school buses are kind of a big deal. Um, also, as people have said, Fairfax County has the second largest school bus fleet in the country. Um, so when you put those two facts together with the fact that transportation is the largest cause of greenhouse emissions, it just made our group realize that Fairfax can make a really big difference if we switch to electric school buses. 
and also it made us realize that we should be a real leader on this. Um, so on top of this, electric school buses really seemed just like a no-brainer to us from a practicality standpoint. They're safer, they're healthier, they're less expensive to operate. The maintenance is much less, the cost of electricity versus diesel is much, um, much less. So obviously the upfront cost of the buses is still a lot, but we're learning, as has been said tonight, there are creative financing programs all around us. Um, so it, I really think we can make this happen. So the big thing that we learned that made the biggest difference to us um, and, and really drove us forward was that we learned that the life cycle of a diesel school bus is 15 years. So it really struck us how similar that time frame is to the 11 years that the UN Climate Panel has said is the absolute cutoff point to turn back our emissions and avoid the worst effects of climate change. It made us realize we simply can't buy one more diesel school bus because mm -hmm. it locks us into 15 years of fossil fuel emissions and our kids' future can't afford that. So that brings me to the last thing, our kids. So my kids are here, their friends are here, and I, I'm gonna point out my daughter Katie over there. <laughs> she she um, is involved in the youth climate movement and spends all her free time doing this. Like I think her school work is Thank you. 